Welcome to Sullivan and Cromwell's Energy Trends podcast series. With me today are my partners, George Sampas and Werner Allers. George and Werner are partners in the M&A group, and they focus on energy and natural resources. Today, we will be discussing some of the trends that we're seeing in the energy space. M&A deal activity in energy in the first quarter of 2021 has been showing continued signs of recovery from the initial pandemic dip that started from the second half of 2020. From the first days of the Biden administration, we have seen clear focus on climate and energy policy as a priority of the new administration. On his first day in office, President Biden announced executive orders on America rejoining the Paris Climate Accord Agreement, revoking the permit for the Keystone XL pipeline, and establishing a moratorium on federal leases in the Arctic Wildlife Refuge. President Biden pledged on April 22nd, Earth Day, to cut U.S. greenhouse gas emissions in half by 2030. That's more than double the country's prior commitment under the 2015 Paris Climate Agreement forged by the Obama administration. This follows the unveiling of a $2 trillion infrastructure proposal last month with ample measures to curb climate change. President Biden's current plan is a departure from the environmental policy under former President Trump, who rolled back over 100 regulations during his four years in office, and more comprehensive than the climate policy that was introduced during the eight years of former President Barack Obama. First, let's talk a little bit about what the energy M&A picture has looked like in the past year. How was 2020 for dealmaking, and what were the prospects going into the first quarter of this year? Well, thank you, Frank. As you noted, 2020, which saw the second quarter looking at the beginning of lockdown measures in response to the pandemic, was a really tumultuous year and by no means was energy immune from the general deal-making trends in M&A. The first half saw a significant dip in deals. And even though there was a strong recovery in certain sectors in the energy industry in the second half, you know, this really varied from sector to sector, and it didn't completely offset the declines in deal-making that we had starting at the beginning of 2020. And just to give some examples, by the time we got to the end of 2020, there was a reduction compared to 2019 in value from $347 billion of energy M&A in 2019 to you know, just over half of that of $218 billion. And there were particular sectors in the energy industry that were hardest hit. I think probably the hardest hit one was oil field services, where there was about a 90% reduction in deal value in 2020 when compared to 2019. Upstream was also down approximately 50% in deal value from $134 billion in 2019 to $70 billion. But there were other segments in the industry like midstream and downstream that weren't quite as significantly affected. Midstream in particular had one very large deal of Pipe China's $55 billion acquisition of Sinopex and PetroChina's assets. And that offset a lower deal count, which was about half in 2020, to result in deal values being slightly up in 2020 when compared to 2019. So as we started 2021, We obviously had a significant change with the new administration and the change in expectations that brought with it in terms of U.S. policy towards energy administration. What do you think are the significant energy policy changes that we have already seen from the Biden administration, and how do you think they're going to affect energy M&A? I think President Biden's announcement that he was vetoing the Keystone Pipeline was a game changer. I think companies are very unsure about the energy policies that will come into play during the Biden administration and are going to be more reluctant to allocate capital to new infrastructure, except if that infrastructure or those capital investments are related to clean energy. In talking to our clients, 
They would love to have more investments in clean energy, but those are difficult to find. Transactions in that sector are tough just because there aren't as many available assets to acquire. I think that when you add it to the ESG pressure at companies these days is going to mean that while there will be M&A activity in the upstream space, in the midstream space, there's likely to be less of it. And where there are acquisitions, I think you'll see more share for share deals rather than cash deals. And I think you'll see similar to the ConocoPhillips deal with Concho, acquisitions in the same basin that are designed to achieve synergies and grow footprints for drilling that are contiguous. So that's what I expect this year and next year, and we'll see. And what legislation should we be looking towards and expecting from the Biden administration in the energy sector? I think George is exactly right regarding the likely fallout of the Biden administration's focus on the energy industry and how people are going to be thinking about new investments and deals. In the meantime, I think that the legislative and regulatory agendas are continuing to come into focus, Frank. But I think, as you noted at the beginning, Biden really hit the ground running from his first days of the administration by issuing the executive order on tackling the climate crisis at home and abroad, I think within the first days of his inauguration, that set the tone for many of the policy proposals to come. Of course, as you mentioned, the whole thrust of that order were the significant and ambitious goals of having carbon pollution in the power sector by 2025 in the U.S. and a net zero economy by 2050. But there were other things to highlight from those early announcements as well, such as the indefinite moratorium on entering into new oil and natural gas leases on public lands and launching a more rigorous review process of all existing leasing and permitting practices related to the fossil fuel development on public lands. So really, from the beginning, it was clear that as part of an overall climate change agenda, we could also expect significantly more regulatory scrutiny of traditional energy projects, as evidenced by the announcement regarding the Keystone Pipeline that George mentioned. More recently, Biden's really continued these themes, both with his address to the joint session of Congress and his recent announcements, really a flurry of recent announcements around Earth Day that were covering both domestic policy agendas and international initiatives that were tied both to climate change and the energy industry's role in it. Biden continued to reinforce the theme that his overall progressive American jobs agenda is inextricably linked with the administration's climate change and clean energy goals. And as part of this, he's announced a number of new initiatives that the administration is attempting to pass into legislation. Domestically, most, if not all, of the announced infrastructure agenda initiatives that are related to the energy sector are focused on clean energy projects. For example, on April 23rd, the White House announced that the president's working group on coal and power plant communities would support the direction of federal resources in these communities towards projects that would really accelerate the transition away from coal power to jobs in the areas of pollution mitigation and environmental remediation, as well as workforce training in the clean energy and infrastructure sectors. Around the same time that week, the White House also announced a focus on the goals of accelerating the deployment of electric vehicles and charging stations. In addition to the greenhouse gas reduction targets, domestic infrastructure plan, and focus on electric vehicles and clean energy, the Biden administration has also been refocusing U.S. global leadership in international climate change initiatives. This has included the U.S. government supporting developing countries in its net zero strategies and reporting their progress under the Paris Agreement as well as directing the International Development Finance Corporation in committing to achieve a net zero investment portfolio by 2040, which is actually the earliest target of any G7 or G20 development finance institution, and also directing DFC to make at least one third of all of its new investments to have a climate nexus by the beginning of 2023. In addition, the Biden administration has also been focusing on energy finance and its role in accelerating the transition to a clean energy economy. For example, he announced that the United States intends to double by 2024 its annual public climate finance to developing countries relative to the average level during the second half of the Obama-Biden administration. 
And the U.S. is also going to be reviving its participation in mission and innovation, which is an initiative to increase government budgets for renewable energy resource development and deployment. All of these themes also run through the $2.3 trillion infrastructure proposal that has many elements that are significant for the energy industry. In most ways, though, the infrastructure proposal shifts the focus of investment towards renewable resources. For example, by enacting a 10-year extension and phase down of expanded tax credits for clean energy generation and storage. This is actually one of the most important aspects of the plan for private investment overall, since the infrastructure bill doesn't necessarily have as much of a focus on private investment as other infrastructure proposals have in the past. And it's of a piece with his jobs agenda and the climate change proposals that really focus on accelerating the transition towards a clean energy economy. And we know from our clients that some of them are already meeting with Buttigieg and Senator Manchin in discussions with how to allocate the billions that the government is going to bring to the table to accelerate the green economy. And I just want to pause there. And I think on the U.S. side, there's going to be so much that's going to clean the environment. I think you'll see utilities that are going to continue to diminish the power that they generate from coal. I think you'll find utility boards that are uh, happy to allow utilities to get returns when they shift from coal to renewables or, or natural gas or some less carbon emitting technology. But just keep this in mind as context. We are a world now of 7.8 billion people. And we're going to be in a world of 9.8 billion people in about 30 years. And most of the people, most of that population growth is going to be in non-OECD countries. And the energy that they need is now being largely given by wood, by coal. And these people in those economies aren't going to have the same access to capital to be able to spend on green energy. It's going to be interesting to see over the next few years, if we actually are able to achieve lower carbon emissions worldwide, even with this intense focus on reducing carbon emissions in OECD countries. Excellent observations. Looking at all of the policy changes that we're seeing and can expect from the Biden administration, What do you think are the most significant challenges and opportunities for the energy space? I think we've been talking about a few. I think to summarize, perhaps, you know, clearly there's going to be challenges for oil and gas development upstream, which may, and we'll probably get into this a bit further, but may result in some further consolidation in the industry. And there's going to be increased scrutiny for new pipeline projects, as well as LNG permitting that could limit investment there and could significantly affect the attractiveness of certain deals in that sector. At the same time, there's going to be increased opportunity. That in itself, of course, creates M&A opportunities for those sectors, but then all of the incentives focused that the Biden administration is bringing to clean energy means that there's going to be increased opportunities in the renewable sector, as well as focus even among some of the oil and gas companies to try to reduce their emissions and their operations and looking for opportunities to incorporate new technologies, bring them to scale, all of which may be something that they find they can do through acquisitions, as well as incorporating and growing their own implementation of certain technologies and developing assets. Thank you for listening to SNC Critical Insights. For more information about our practice, please visit us on the web at www.solcrom.com. Mm-hmm.